Okay, so thank you all for coming. The global economy in recent years, and in particular the post-pandemic era, is characterized by both prosperity and struggle. Here in India, while top-line economic growth numbers have remained strong, productivity in many sectors has actually stagnated or declined. Businesses face stiffer global competition, more stringent regulation, and a consumer base with declining spending power. In this difficult economic climate, it's natural for business leaders to double down on that old paradigm, that the only way to eke out a profit is to squeeze more productivity out of frontline workers for less compensation. That wages and benefits for workers are costs to be minimized. Workers, understandably, feel unheard, undervalued, and maligned. Both sides dig in, <coughs> and conflict replaces cooperation as the norm. And we're seeing this play out in the increasing number of mass protests, strike actions, and even violence here in India and around the world. But if the trials and tribulations of the past few years have taught us anything, it's that the lives of these workers, their successes and failures, their health and well-being, are fundamentally important to the broader economic story. Businesses and consumers alike have been shown quite forcefully just how valuable the health and safety and well-being of frontline workers can be. It seems pretty self-evident then that there's an interdependency between the well-being of workers and the well-being of businesses. But we still collectively continue to frame this issue as a moral one. We tell the private sector, hey, we know it's a pain, we know it hurts your bottom line, but you have to treat your workers well because it's the right thing to do. And for the most part, the private sector points to the bottom line and says, we wish we could do more, but we got to stay afloat. Well, we're here to tell you today that the data have spoken. It turns out that the mandate for investing in the well-being of frontline workers is both moral and economic. <coughs> Put simply, businesses thrive when they take care of their workers. And this means that there should be more than just a moral imperative to share prosperity in the global economy. There is an economic imperative as well. The problem is most businesses don't have a reliable source of hard evidence that demonstrates just how much a specific investment in improving worker well-being can boost their bottom line. And that lack of clarity prevents a large number of businesses from investing more in their workers. So that's what we set out to do through the work we do at Good Business Lab, the nonprofit that I helped to found, along with Anant Abuja and Anant Naishadam. Our process is fairly simple. We talk to both workers and managers to understand their respective pain points. And we use this information to co-design solutions that we think might wor meet workers' needs and also create business returns. We develop hypotheses about a solution's effectiveness, but importantly, we remain agnostic, meaning we wait to let the data tell us what the impacts are. And to be honest, we're often surprised by what ends up working and what ends up not. Next, we set up rigorous studies to evaluate these impacts. To do this, we partner with organizations to experiment right on their shop or factory floors. And then we do A-B testing, just like any company would do to see whether a new product or a new service was worth implementing. This usually means randomly allocating workers to either a treatment group who receives the program or a control group who doesn't. Finally, we track both groups over time so that we can assess 
how different the treatment group's outcomes are compared to the controls as a result of the program. We survey workers to measure their satisfaction levels, their physical and mental health, their career plans, their finances, their relationships, and much more. And then we work with businesses to get hard data on workers' performance and remuneration. Things like productivity, absenteeism, wages, quit rates, career progression, etc. And these data allow us to estimate the impacts of the program on both worker well-being and business outcomes. So, what have we learned from all of this experimentation? The biggest takeaway is that there are tangible things that businesses can do right now to make their workers happier and more productive. I'm gonna talk about four lessons that we've learned from our research about which investments matter. Lesson number one, soft skills matter. Conventional wisdom dictates that soft skills like collaboration, communication, and confidence are relevant only in white-collar workplaces. But after we studied the root causes of productivity issues for frontline manufacturing workers, we realized that soft skills could be as useful for those workers as anywhere. We found in one experiment that when we provided female garment workers with training in some of these skills, these women were better able to coordinate and resolve production issues, and this increased productivity by 18% over controls. The training was relatively cheap, and so the return on investment was huge for the firm, about 250% by the end of our tracking period. And it turns out that it's not just the soft skills of frontline workers that matter. Middle managers, who are foremen, supervisors, shift managers, etc., they also play a critical role in determining team productivity. It all comes down to effective leadership. Things like open communication, capacity building, planning, culture setting, emotional intelligence, conflict and stress management, these are all soft skills that middle managers often aren't equipped with, but absolutely need to enable their team's success. So we went back to the garment factories where we ran the first experiment and designed a new training specifically tailored for production line supervisors. <laughs> and we found that training middle managers in these skills was incredibly effective. It boosted productivity by 6% and decreased turnover by 15%. It was also good for frontline workers who earned larger bonuses because their teams were more productive. Lesson two, worker voice matters. Martin Luther King once said that a riot is the voice of the unheard. When frontline workers feel unheard, when their legitimate frustrations aren't addressed by their employers, at best, they part ways and leave businesses scrambling to hire and train new workers. At worst, their frustrations erupt into protests, strikes, and violence. We've done a series of experiments in which we provided frontline workers with tools to amplify their voices. The tool is a channel, a hotline or a text chat or an app through which workers can engage in two-way anonymous communication with their managers. This anonymity is really critical to establishing trust, and it takes trust to voice concerns without fear of getting fired or passed over for a promotion. So if a worker feels, for example, that her boss has made inappropriate comments about her appearance at work, she can report that behavior anonymously, follow up with more details, and have HR or upper management take action to address negative behavior. Through our experiments, we've again and again unearthed the same basic facts. Frontline workers have a very limited ability to voice their concerns. They're dissatisfied about their wages and the way that they're treated in the workplace. And when you give them an outlet to voice these concerns, their satisfaction levels rise they stick around longer in their jobs, 
and they put in more effort. And this works even if only a small fraction of the workforce feels disenfranchised at any given time. Just knowing that you can reach out to someone if you need to, and that your concerns will be appropriately addressed, that's valuable to workers. And the best news of all for businesses is that when you do this right, productivity increases as a result of the decrease in turnover and absenteeism. Lesson three, holistic health matters. The pandemic made painfully clear to all of us that there's a link between workers' health and business outcomes. When workers fall sick or have to leave work to care for their sick loved ones, or they suffer financial distress, their own lives are turned upside down, but their struggles also create ripple <coughs> effects that impact employers, communities, and the end consumers of the things that they help to create. But what we've found is that this relationship isn't just strong for physical health. Frontline workers often struggle with mental health issues. For example, migrant women workers leaving their rural homes for jobs in the big city often experience bouts of loneliness, anxiety, and depression particularly as they arrive and struggle to cr create a community in their new environment. We co-created a program that matches new migrants with more seasoned migrant buddies who share their background. We found that the program boosts mental health for both junior and senior migrants, and that participants are substantially more productive and less likely to leave the firm as a result. Small investments in workers' mental health can improve well-being and raise the bottom line in big ways. Lesson four, environmental conditions in the workplace matter. Workers in India, as all of us, deal with extreme heat and pollution on a daily basis. And this is only gonna worsen over time with the impacts of climate change. This summer, Several areas of India recorded temperatures above 50 degrees Celsius. The heat wave resulted in more than 25,000 hospitalizations. And when the heat subsides, several of India's largest cities have the worst pollution of any place on Earth. Just showing up to work during these times is like smoking several packs of cigarettes a day. Not only are these conditions really bad for workers' health, but they're also incredibly bad for productivity. But we found that evidence from outside of the lab on this link was pretty scant. So to fill that gap, we went out and installed sensors all over factory floors, and then collected data over a long period of time on temperature and pollution. And then we matched these data to detailed worker productivity data from the same factories. What we found was really startling. For every one degree Celsius the temperature increases, productivity decreases by a whopping 4%. Spikes in pollution have a similar but slightly smaller impact. What this means is that for businesses who have to operate under these conditions, investing in common sense mitigation measures, things like up-to-date ventilation systems or masks for workers, which can seem costly up front, can have transformative effects on worker health and safety, as well as the firm's bottom line. And there's a last lesson that we've learned, this one the hard way, and that is that change doesn't come easy. Creating the evidence base that demonstrates exactly how worker well-being translates into good business is a necessary first step. But most of the time, information alone is not enough to convince businesses to take the leap. Managers don't have the time or attention to run new trainings or develop technologies in-house or research the right kinds of well-being initiatives for their workers. So a big part of what Good Business Lab does is translate these research insights into easily consumable products and services and also help our firm partners to design and implement their own solutions. 
because the goal in doing this research is not just to publish it and admire the work on my shelf, which, let's be honest, I do from time to time. It's also to use these insights to affect real change in the lives of frontline workers around the world. And that's where you all come in. There has never been a more appropriate time than now to reach out and start a conversation about ways to invest a little bit more in your organization's frontline workforce. Change always begins by challenging the status quo. Change making is just as much about reshaping norms and culture as it is about evidence building and decision making based on that evidence. Whether you're a business owner, an executive, a manager, or maybe you're a frontline worker yourself, whatever role you play, you can take this small but concrete step to help shape a new culture around worker well being. Because when our voices come together, our whispers can become a shout. And together, we can move closer to the ideal of shared prosperity in our time. Thank you so much. <laughs>